us what is actually physics. In many textbooks, it says that physics is actually a study of matter and energy. Matter and energy. And this matter and energy exists in many areas. Well, from as big as a galaxy to our planet Earth and to something as small as the atom itself. Now, the textbook itself will then continue to explain a little bit more about what matter is all about. And as you can see in this picture, matters are made out of these small tiny ball-like things which are used to represent atoms, so they are very tiny. And when these small tiny atoms are bonded together or joined together by this stuff which is used to represent forces, some special forces, this creates a mass or uh, this creates something which we call a molecule. Right? And this essentially makes up what matter is. And on the left, on the right hand side, I'm sorry, on the right hand side, this is a picture of a light bulb which is used to illustrate energy. And you can tell this is basically talking about light energy. So physics, most textbooks will try or attempt to explain that, hey, matters are made out of atoms and energy, example of that is light. And the relationship between these two basically is what physics is all about. Well, um, many of us don't really get it even at this point. So let me tr try to help you understand what physics is all about at the ordinary level. Well, physics is about things that happens around us. Okay, and you may ask, hey, what are the things that happens around us? Well, these four pictures capture beautifully what physics is all about at our level. Okay, the very uh, first one on the left hand side shows a cyclist on a bike. This is what we call general physics and it concerns about itself about the study of motion, about how things move, um, about uh, what causes a motion to, to occur, what causes things to speed up and slow down and co or come to a rest. And we also discussed the energy aspect of it like kinetic energy and potential energy. On the next picture, as you can see, is a flame and this is uh, what we call the thermal physics aspect. Okay, And in this area, we look at how heat is part of our life how heat travels from one place to another and to another heat is just another different term for thermal energy and uh, how this heat affects things around us for example how heat actually melts a piece of ice for example or when water when it's placed into a freezer what causes it to freeze so all these are dealt with in under uh, under this area called thermal physics on the pic third picture is so uh, you guys you can see it's a it's a sea waves, it's a quite a big one at that. And in this particular area, we call it the optics aspect of physics. Optics simply means the study of light, waves and sound. Even as you're listening to this video right now, uh, the sound aspect of it, okay, how does the sound come to you? Uh, move into your ear and allow you to be able to listen to me. And uh, you are able to look at this video, that's the aspect of light, we would like to study that as well, okay? And lastly, well, we can see a lightning across the sky. So this simply suggests we uh, one branch of physics is the uh, concerns the electricity and magnetism as aspect of it. Okay, so how electricity is used to power the fan, right? Uh, in the um, how does it light up a room, and the effect of magnetism? Why is it that um, a piece of magnet is able to attract uh, a piece of iron? So all these are covered under electricity and magnetism. So I hope with that um, short uh, introduction, I have helped you to understand a little bit better about what you are expected to study at the ordinary level for physics. And uh, to move on, just a selection, uh, just to share a selection of physicists that has that uh, whom have made an impact in our life. And these are Galileo Galilei, Rene Descartes, Sir Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein. Uh, measuring in the Cambridge course, you use a rule to measure distance. You can use a set square sometimes to help you get the straight edge of an object and line it up with a ruler. That would help you be more accurate. You can use a stopwatch or stop clock to measure the time. But don't forget about your reaction time when you press a button on the stopwatch. Your reaction time could be about 0.2 of a second. It might be more or less depending on the circumstances. It can be more accurate and more precise if you measure a large number of oscillations, for example a pendulum swinging back and forth. If you count 10 oscillations and then divide by 10, you get a more accurate measurement of the time for one oscillation. You use a measuring cylinder to measure volumes of fluids. 
and the thinner the measuring cylinder, the more precise it is. You'd get smaller graduations on the scale. When you measure to the, um, to the liquid, you measure to the bottom of the meniscus. The liquid curves up slightly as the, at the edges. So it's important to make sure your eye is level with the bottom of the meniscus before reading it. If you're measuring a very small distance, it would be more accurate to measure more of the same object and then divide. For example, if you measured the thickness of this ream of paper as being 50 millimeters and it has 500 sheets, the thickness of one sheet can be calculated by dividing by the number of sheets. Pararex error. A pararex error is an error in reading an instrument due to the eye of the observer and pointer are not in a line perpendicular to the plane of the scale. Eh? Okay, now let's see this example here. Uh, so we have a scale here. Okay, so this is called the plane of the scale. And then uh, this is the eye of the observer. So uh, in this case, eh, okay, in, at this position, the eye of the observer is at right angle or perpendicular to the plane of the scale. And this is the correct positions for the eye okay, of the observer. Now, if uh, this is the case, eh, if you read it from here, then it's the a line perpendicular to the plane of the scale and uh, there's no parex error. But if you read it, above this line okay so then your readings uh, this is your readings your reading may be slightly higher than the actual readings so the difference of the reading is called the parex error uh, also this one uh, okay if the positions of the eye is here then uh, the, the reading may be slightly lower than the actual readings uh, then uh, the difference is called the parex error so parex error is caused by the positions of the observer's eye, which is not perpendicular to the plane of the scale. Just now we already discussed zero error. Now uh, in this slide, I'm going to discuss into the detail of zero error. What you need to know about zero error in uh, SPM. Zero error arises when the measuring instrument does not start from exactly zero. Examples, if there's, let's say this is a scale of uh, this ammeters, okay? And if there is no current flow through the ammeters, uh, the pointer start from exactly zero. Right? It should be here. And uh, if this is the case, then there's no zero error. Okay. But sometimes, uh, okay, you will find that the pointer does not start from uh, exactly zero. Okay, it's slightly higher than zero. Okay, or after zero. Um, for this case, uh, we say it has a positive zero error. If the pointer is slightly higher than zero. Okay, then this is called a positive zero error. Uh, sometimes the pointer may be slightly lower than zero. Eh? Okay, and uh, we call this a negative zero error. So from here we can see that uh, zero error can be positive or negative. Eh? Okay, so when you make measurements, uh, if you realize zero error, you must know that whether it's a positive zero error or negative zero error. Uh, then only you can remove the error. If you don't know whether it's positive or negative, then, uh, it's, then you can't remove the error. Okay, so let's see this example. Okay, so this is a stopwatch. Okay, and uh, the stopwatch shows some readings. And uh, if we press the reset buttons, uh, if we press the reset buttons, the pointers should go back to zero. Eh? The pointers should go back to zero. But um, if you press the reset button and this is what you get, that's fine. There's no zero error, okay? It's because the pointer point exactly at zero. So there's no zero error. But if you press the reset buttons and this is what you get. So the pointer does not go back to zero, but it's slightly higher than zero. Eh? Uh, so what do you all think? Is this positive zero error or negative zero error? The pointer points to a place slightly higher than zero. This is a positive zero error okay and um this is one second huh? okay one second so therefore this one is uh, 0 0.2 0 0.4 seconds so the pointer point at 0 0.4 seconds uh so therefore we say this is a positive zero error and the uh, zero error is positive 0 0.4 seconds huh? so when you state a zero error uh, you advise to state the positive and negative signs of the error whether it's a positive zero error or negative zero error okay uh let's see another example let's say this is what you get uh this is zero and the pointer points slightly uh before the zero mark here so therefore this is a negative 
zero error, right? And uh, each scale shows 0 0.2 seconds. Huh? So therefore we say uh, the zero error is negative 0 0.2 seconds. So when you write zero error, make sure that you include the positive or negative signs of the zero error. Uh, so that is what you need to know about zero error. And the different kind of measurements that we'll be making in class. So first we need to talk about the set of units that are used by scientists. And it's called the SI unit system. It's what all scientists use when they're doing experiments or uh, presenting their findings from those experiments. And it's mostly based on the metric system. So the question is, why would scientists use uh, one standard set of units? Well, there are a few reasons. One of the biggest reasons is so that they can work together. They also need to be able to reproduce experiments and uh, get the same results. So if one scientist were working with, let's say, meters, and the other was working with feet, uh, there's a slight difference there, and this is going to make sure that uh, all experiments can be reproduced. It's just important that everyone is speaking the same language when they're sharing their work with other people. And the best reason for me, it's easier. So a lot of you are probably sitting there asking, well, how can this be easier? I don't, I don't know what a meter is. I know what a yard is. Well, let's take a look at two different scenarios here. In the metric system, if we want to convert something like, let's say, 3.12 kilometers to meters, it's pretty simple. There are 1,000 meters in one kilometer, so all I need to do is move that decimal point over three spaces and I end up with 3,120 meters. Now, if we look at the standard system that we use, let's say we want to change 3.12 might be too difficult. So let's try something simpler. Let's convert three miles to feet. Now, remember when we did the metric system, I just had to move the decimal point. With this standard system, it's not quite as easy. So there are 5,280 feet per mile. Try to move that decimal place now. So you have to go and calculate this. So if we do the math right, let me get my calculator. Okay, let me get my slide rule. All right, let me get my eraser. Okay, all right, I got it. It's 15,840 feet. That was a pain. The standard system isn't based on anything that's simple. It's based on fractions, really. Uh, and like originally a foot was defined as the length of the king's foot. Well, guess what? The king died and you had a new king. So you had a new foot. So it's just kind of confusing. I mean, we do have a standard foot now, but it's not as easy as using something that's based on tens. Okay. All we need to do with the metric system is move the decimal point around. It's a lot easier to do that than to do that messy math that we had to do with the standard system. So let's get rid of that. So in the metric system, like we said earlier, it's all based on multiples of 10. And we have these prefixes. So all we need to do is add these prefixes to the, the base unit. So like a meter is the base unit for length or the liter is the base unit for volume. All we have to do is add these prefixes to that base unit, and then we know what we have. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the, the real important ones that we have here that we'll be using are kilo, which means 1,000. The base unit, obviously, which is 1. So what I mean by the base unit is that, you know, a meter or a liter or a gram, things like that. And centi means 1 one hundredth. So we're all familiar with centimeters. That just means it's one one hundredth of a meter. And then a millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. So some other kind of fun ones that you might want to think about knowing is giga, which means one billion. So a gigameter would be one billion meters. There's a mega, which is a million. Micro, which is one millionth. 
and nano, which is one billionth. Now you've probably heard of heard those in places before. Like uh, if anyone knows anything about computers, you've heard of a gigabyte. Okay, and a, so a gigabyte is just a billion bytes, and a megabyte would be a million bytes. Some of you that may really be into computers may know what a kilobyte is. Uh, I know things don't come in kilobytes anymore, but a kilobyte is a thousand bytes. And micro, one one millionth, like we said. So I'm sure some of you have heard of nanotechnology. That just means it's there are things that are built on the scale of one billionth of a meter. That's some pretty small stuff. So let's take a look at some of the things we'll be measuring. First we'll look at distance. So the base unit for distance, like we have said earlier, is meter. So one meter is the base unit. Now like I said with the uh, standard system that we use where the king's foot used to be the, the standard that we use to measure distance, the king's foot would change. Every new king would have a new foot size. But with the meter, the meter is defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the pole. That doesn't change. There are other variations of this, like we had said, and all we need to do is plug in some of those prefixes that we had just mentioned. So I'm sure you've heard of centimeter or millimeter or kilometer. Okay, so a centimeter would be one one hundredth of a meter. Millimeter would be one one thousandth of a meter. And a kilometer would be one thousand meters. Now it's important that we know what tool we have to use to measure distance. And I'm sure most of you know we use a meter stick. And you can see in this picture here, this meter stick is broken up into a hundred parts. So each one of those numbers represents one one hundredth of a meter or a centimeter. The next measurement we'll look at is mass. So mass is the measurement of how much matter an object contains. And like we looked at in the gizmo, this doesn't change no matter where we are because objects do not lose matter. So the base unit for mass is a gram. And a gram is defined as the amount of matter in one cubic centimeter of pure water or one milliliter of pure water. So the mass of that tiny little cube of water is equal to one gram. So again we have other variations just by plugging in those prefixes like milli, so we have milligrams, I'm sure you, most of you have heard of that, and kilograms. So a milligram would be one one thousandth of a gram and a kilogram would be one thousand grams. And the tool that we use to measure mass is the triple beam balance. We'll spend some time working in class with these. Another measurement we're going to look at is weight. Now weight is a measurement of the force of gravity on an object. And the base unit for weight is a Newton. The abbreviation for that is a capital N. And a gram is defined as the amount of force you need to accelerate one kilogram of matter one meter per second. Doesn't quite make sense yet, but I think once we get into uh, acceleration and forces in motion, uh, you'll understand that a little better. And the tool that we use for weight is called a spring scale. Okay, that picture is what you, we're probably going to be using quite a bit in class, but spring scales aren't as uncommon as you would think. If you've been to the grocery store, the things that you put your, your food in to sort of find their weight is a spring scale. So you put your food in that little pan and it pulls a spring. And that's how that little dial moves. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the bathroom scale. That works with a spring as well. You step on the scale and it compresses a spring a certain amount. And depending on how much that spring is compressed, that's how much the little dial moves and tells you what your weight is. And the last thing we're going to talk about is volume. So volume is a measurement of how much space an object takes up. The base unit for volume is a liter. 
So a liter is defined as the amount of space taken up by one kilogram of water. Now a lot like when we talked about uh, mass, where one gram was equal to one cubic centimeter of water, a liter is the amount of space taken up by one kilogram of water. So water plays a big role in the metric system. Now other variations of the liter are a milliliter, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and a cubic centimeter. Now that sounds a little weird because we're talking about liters, but a cubic centimeter is the unit that's used when you measure uh, regular, regularly shaped objects. So when you, mul when you do the math, you end up multiplying centimeter times centimeter times centimeter, and you end up with a unit of cubic centimeters. And we'll talk about that in the next frame. But before that, we need to talk about the tool used for measuring volume. And the tool used is, well, there isn't really one tool. So let's take a look at different ways we can measure volume. So if we're talking about measuring the volume of regularly shaped objects, we can use the tool of math. So here are some regularly shaped objects, like a cylinder or a sphere or cone, rectangular solids, and then that weird looking bagel thing there. It's called a torus. And there are plenty others, like pyramids and uh, all sorts. I'm sure you can figure some out. Ooh, how about a dodecahedron? So to find the volumes of these kinds of things, we just need to use formulas. So here's a formula for cylinder and a sphere. There's a cone and there's a torus, and they look pretty confusing. Uh, I don't think you have to worry too much. We probably won't use cone and torus and too many others. We may slip the cylinder and sphere one in there here and there. But the one we'll be using most of all is the formula for a rectangular solid. And that you're probably familiar with. The volume is found by multiplying the length, height, and width of the solid. So when you do that, you're actually multiplying measurements of centimeter times centimeter times centimeter. And that's how you end up with centimeters cubed. So on your graphic organizer, there is a diagram there for you to take a look at. And what I'd like you to do is to do the math and figure out the volume of that rectangular solid on your graphic organizer. Now, what do you do if you have an irregularly shaped object? We do need to use tools for this. So let's say you had a rock, okay? And imagine that rock is small enough to fit into a graduated cylinder. What we have to do is we take that rock and put it in there. So let's go through the process here. First thing we need to do is put some water in the graduated cylinder. And the next thing we should do is measure the amount of water that we put in there. Then you carefully take that rock and put it in there. Okay? If you drop it in there real fast, you're going to splash and lose some water. So be careful when you do that. So you notice when I put the rock in there, the water level went up. So we need to now measure the new water level. Now we do some simple math. We just subtract the first measurement from the second. So what happened here is when we put the rock in, it displaced some of that water and made the water level rise. And this method of finding volume is called displacement. And there are other ways to do this as well. Imagine we've got a rock that's too big to fit in a graduated cylinder. Well, they have these things called overflow cups. And the way this works is you fill up the overflow cup with water until a little bit of water starts to drip out of the spout. And then you place a graduated cylinder underneath the spout. And when you carefully place the rock in, the water level rises, and that water pours into the graduated cylinder. Now all you need to do is measure the amount of water in the graduated cylinder, and the volume of that water is the water that was displaced by the rock. So that's the volume of your rock. To slide open the movable auxiliary scale or movable jaw, hold the vernier in one hand and use your thumb to roll the jaw's adjustment wheel in or out. The movable scale should slide easily. Some calipers have a locking mechanism to secure the auxiliary scale in place. So if it does not slide easily, check to make sure that the locking mechanism is not engaged.
To measure the length of an object, simply slide open the caliper's auxiliary scale and place the object between the large jaws. Then firmly close the jaws on the object and make your reading. To measure the outer diameter of a round object, such as a cylinder or sphere, slide open the caliper's auxiliary scale and place the object between the large jaws. Note that when measuring the outer diameter of a cylinder, the jaws should be perpendicular to the cylinder's length. This ensures that an accurate reading of the diameter will be made. If the jaws are parallel to the cylinder's length, it is quite likely that an inaccurate reading will be made. Once the jaws are properly closed around the object, make your reading. To measure the inner diameter of a hollow cylinder, such as a pipe or length of tubing, slide open the caliper's auxiliary scale and place the small jaws within the cylinder's hollow opening. Then expand the jaws so they make good contact with the inner wall of the cylinder and make your reading. To measure the depth of a hole, slide open the caliper's auxiliary scale and place the depth indicator into the hole. Adjust the auxiliary scale so that the length of the depth indicator is exactly that of the depth of the hole. Once the auxiliary scale is properly positioned, a reading may be made. Note that the length of the depth indicator is equal to the separation of the caliper's jaws. Most vernier calipers purchased in the United States give readings in both inches and centimeters. As always in physics, we will work with metric units. Like a meter stick, the vernier caliper is calibrated in centimeters with the minor or smallest divisions in millimeters. However, unlike a meter stick, the vernier caliper allows the fractional part of the smallest division to be accurately determined, not merely estimated. Using the vernier caliper to measure the length of an object is not as difficult as it may appear. The first line on the movable vernier scale is called the zero mark. To make a reading, note where the zero mark on the movable scale falls on the main scale. In this example, the zero mark falls between the sixth and seventh major divisions on the main scale, so we know the reading will be between six and seven centimeters. If we study the caliper more closely, we see that the zero mark on the movable scale also falls between the third and fourth minor divisions. Therefore, the reading will be between 6.3 and 6.4 centimeters. To accurately determine the fractional part of the smallest division, you must decide which line on the movable scale coincides with the mark on the main scale. Here you can see the second line on the movable scale matches a line on the main scale. So the fractional part of the smallest division is 0.02 centimeters. Therefore, the length is measured to be 6.32 centimeters. Try to determine the length of the aluminum block yourself. Here is the vernier reading as measured by one of our students. Pause the video now to determine for yourself the length of the block. If you determined that the length is 3.29 centimeters, then you were correct. If you recorded the length to be 3.28 or 3.30 centimeters, Replay the video and closely observe that it is only the ninth line of the auxiliary scale which matches exactly with the division on the main scale. Therefore, the reading is 3.29 centimeters. Now try to determine the radius of this aluminum sphere.
pause the video so you can accurately read the vernier. If you determined that the radius is 1.12 centimeters, then you were correct. If you found the radius to be 2.24 centimeters, recall that the vernier measured the sphere's diameter, not its radius. The SI unit for length is none other than the meters, and the symbol for this unit is the small letter M. Now, let's have a look at the types of instruments that can be used to measure length. Essentially, there are four, okay, and these types of the choice of instrument that we use depends very much on the length to be measured and also the accuracy required. In this table, you find that there are four common items that we use in the lab for measuring length. The first one is the tape measure. The tape measure is suitable for measuring lengths of up to a few meters. Some tape measures are supplied or can be purchased um, up to a maximum of uh, 2 meters in length or even up to 5 or even 10 meters. So it's very suitable for measuring dimension of a room. The next picture, you see a meter rule. As the name suggests, a meter rule is able to measure up to a maximum of one meter length. All right. So this is a useful uh, instrument for us to measure the width or a tabletop, for example. Okay. The third item here is known as the vernier caliper. The vernier caliper itself, it is good to measure um, lengths up to a few centimeters. So for example, it is suitable to use to measure the thickness of a laptop. Now, the next item, the next instrument is the micrometer screw gauge. This is useful for measuring up to lengths of a few millimeters. Okay, so for example, the thickness of a coin. In the next slide, we will discover more about the ranges of which this measure, uh, these instruments can be used for measurement and also their accuracy. Now, this table shows you the approximate range and accuracy of the four instruments. Okay. For the meter rule, as you can see, it is good for measuring items from 0 to 1 meter range and has an accuracy of 0 0.1 centimeters. In other words, when we use a meter rule to make measurements in the units centimeter, we can always write down accurate to one decimal place of a centimeter. For example, the length of a table can be 56.4 centimeters. So one decimal place here, one decimal place. For measuring tape, the approximate range as mentioned is from 0 to 10 meters and its accuracy is similar to that of a meter rule. Again, one decimal place of a centimeters. Now, for the vernier caliper itself, it is ideal for measuring lengths of between 2 to 10 centimeters. In terms of millimeters, it is good for 20 to 100 millimeters. So, the accuracy of a vernier caliper is 0 0.01 centimeters. This means that we can actually measure lengths of uh, that which are accurate to two decimal places of a centimeter when using a caliper. Comparing between a caliper and a meter rule or a measuring tape, we will find that it is able to give us a more accurate reading. So examples of a vernier caliper reading could be 3.24. So again, take note, there are two decimal places here, as indicated by the accuracy. Okay. Now, by now you should have an idea that this instrument, the last one on the table, the micrometer screw gauge, okay, it is more accurate compared to the other instruments at the top. All right. It can actually measure up to an accuracy of 0 0.001 centimeters. In other words, it can give us reading accurate up to three decimal place of a centimeters. So an example of a reading could be 0 0.752 centimeters. There are three decimal places here. Okay. We can also use a micrometer to measure in terms of the unit millimeters. All right. And uh, if that's the case, the accuracy will be up to a two decimal place of a millimeters. So examples of a reading could be 7.52 millimeters. The range of a micrometer, however, is very small. We can actually just use a micrometer to measure lengths of up from 0 to 3 centimeters or 30 millimeters. 
Now let's have a look at how we can make use of rulers to measure length accurately. Many of us have used it before, but not many of us realize that there are two important points to take note of to make sure that the measurements are very accurate. The first is this. We tend to place objects at the edge of a ruler and we start taking the reading uh, at which the object reaches, the far end of the object reaches. All right. Now, not many of us realize that due to wear and tear, the edge of the ruler may not necessarily be the 0 cm mark. Hence, it is better to place the object as shown in this diagram. Okay, We start measuring from the 1 cm mark and at this particular marking is actually a 2.9 cm marking. So what is the actual length of the object? We can calculate this easily by taking 2.9 minus 1, which is the starting point of the object, and that will give us the actual length of this object itself. All right, so that's the first point to take note of. The second point concerns the placement of our eyes. The placement of these eyes is important. All right? It is important to take note that we must place our eye perpendicular above the scale, where the object H R. All right. By doing so, we can actually tell the marking accurately. Now, compare this position of the eyes with that on the diagram on the right-hand side. If the eyes are positioned um, not perpendicular above the scale, this can result in error as shown. All right? So, the starting point instead of being 1 cm can be uh, read wrongly as 0.9, while the, the other end of the object can be read instead of 2.9, read as 3.0 centimeters. So when we subtract these two readings, it will give us a wrong length. Okay, So this particular error that we have seen due to the wrong placement of the eyes is known as parallax error. All right? So it is important when you are making measurement to avoid parallax errors by placing the eyes directly above the scale. And in general, it is a good idea to take several readings and then calculate the average of these readings. This will give us a more accurate measurement. Right, so um, some fun fact. Do you know that uh, the diameter of a strand of hair is about 1 times 10 to the power of minus 4 meters and that the di diameter of a hydrogen atom is about 1 times 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. All right. So that brings us to the very last slide of this uh, lesson itself. Just to summarize, there are four items that we can use to measure length. A meter rule, measuring tape, vernier caliper, and micrometer. It is also important to recall that among these four, the micrometer is able to give the most accurate reading. However, the micrometer itself has a very limited range of length which it can measure. Okay, For a micrometer, it can actually measure up to 3 decimal place of a centimeter or 2 decimal place of a millimeter, while a vernier caliper can be used to measure accurate up to two decimal place of a centimeter or one decimal place of a millimeter. And the last two items for the meter rule and the measuring tape, both of these can give us an accuracy of measurement up to one decimal place of a centimeter. Lesson 5. Measuring lengths with vernier calipers. Now in this video, I will try to help you understand how we can use the vernier caliper to make measurements. Now before we jump to that, let's have a look at some of the properties of a vernier caliper again. Right? In the previous video, we mentioned that a vernier caliper is ideal for measuring objects with lengths from 2 to 10 cm long. Also take note that some calipers actually are designed to measure in the unit millimeters instead of centimeters. However, both of these, whether they are in centimeters or millimeters, works the same way. Now, the third point is very important. Let's take note of this and recall and remember this. Accuracy of a vernier caliper, if it's designed in centimeters, it is able to give us readings accurate up to two decimal place in a centimeters. If it's a vernier, it's a vernier caliper that is designed in millimeters, it can give us up to one decimal place accuracy. In this slide, let us have a look at some of the important parts of a vernier caliper. There are five of them actually, right? So let's look at some of the major parts here. The first part I'd like to show you guys is actually this, out, this uh, pair of jaws known as the outside jaws. Others may actually call it the external jaws. Both of them, they mean the same thing. 
The use of the external jaw or the outside jaw is meant for us to measure external diameters. For example, for this case, which is a measuring cylinder, we can use the outside jaw to measure the external diameter of the cylinder. Now, this pair of jaws, which are located at the top, smaller in size compared to the outside jaw, is known as the inside jaws or the internal jaws. Now, this pair of jaws are specially designed to allow us to measure the internal diameter of a container. For this example, again, we are using a measuring cylinder and we can actually use that to this inside jaws to give us very accurate reading of the internal diameters. We can't really do this accurately with, um, for example, a meter ruler or a micrometer. The third part is this part known as the tail. Okay, The tail is specially designed to give us measurement of how deep an object is. By pulling this out, we are able to place this tail into a container and therefore allow us to find how deep that container is. Now, to the fourth part that is important in the, on the vernier caliper is this set of lines that we find on its long body. This set of lines are known as the, as the main scale and we can find this similarly on a meter ruler. And the last part are these markings which is found on the bottom part of the vernier scale. These markings with lines on them this is known as the vernier scale. And this vernier scale can be slide along the whole length of the vernier caliper. Now let's have a look at how we can make use of the vernier caliper to make measurements. Right. So let's assume that we have a ball bearing placed between the external jaws. All right. The diameter of the ball bearing that we intend to measure is given by this red color arrow. Interesting enough, when we slide open the vernier scale, the zero of the vernier scale actually moves away from the zero on the main scale. And the length or the diameter of the ball bearing in, is similar to this particular distance here given between the zero of the main scale and the zero of the vernier scale. Right. So, in other words, we can imagine that the ball originally that is being placed between the outside jaws are now being placed between the zero of the main scale and the zero of the vernier scale. So in other words, we can imagine that the that ball bearing, the diameter stretches from the zero on the main scale all the way to the zero on the vernier scale, like this. In the next slide, we will attempt to see how we can actually measure the diameter and read the readings on the vernier caliper. Okay, now this is uh, where we are. So the diameter that we are looking for is given by this arrow and as we mentioned, this diameter is similar to the distance measured from the zero on the main scale to the zero on the vernier scale. So if we stretch this out, this is where the object reaches and if we look closely, we can tell that the length of the object exceeds 3.1 centimeters, which is this marking. Okay, so 3.1 centimeter is this minimum length of the object which we are very sure about. We call this 3.1 centimeters the main scale reading. Take note then, there's this missing length of the object. This missing length indicated by the blue line can be found by looking for some markings on the vernier scale and the technique is this. One of these markings will meet another mark on the main scale and when both of them meet they will line up beautifully to make one straight line like this. The fourth marking on the vernier scale meets this particular line or this marking on the main scale and they line up very nicely over here. Take note, other markings do not achieve the same result. For example, the first marking on the vernier scale, right? It does not meet another line and form a beautiful straight line. Neither does the second, third, fifth, sixth, and so on. Since we now know that it's the fourth marking, this fourth marking is interpreted as 0.04 cm. This 0.04 cm is known as the vernier scale reading. So once we sum up the main scale and the vernier scale reading, we get the full diameter of the ball bearing. So 3.1, we sum that with 0.04 centimeters that will give us 3.14 centimeters. Now let's practice. 
On the next, on this particular slide, okay, we see a vernier caliper that is used to measure in the unit centimeters. The length of this rectangular object is given from here, 0 on the mean scale to the 0 on the vernier scale. So, the mean scale reading, as you can see, it is minimum of 1.10 centimeters. How about the vernier scale reading? So, let's have a look at some of the markings on the vernier scale that makes a beautiful line with another marking on the main scale. So which marking is that? So as we go down the vernier scale, we find that the ninth marking makes a beautiful line with another marking on the main scale. So hence, we look at the vernier, we read the vernier scale as 0 0.09 centimeters. Summing both of this will give us the actual length of the rectangular object. That is 1.19 centimeters okay on the next slide we have two more um, examples of vernier calipers all right these are similar in your notes okay so let's have a look at the one at the top again take note this measures in centimeters so what is the main scale reading for this case the zero on the vernier scale is at this particular position therefore the main scale reading can be read as 1.6 0 centimeters. How about the vernier scale? Recall again the vernier scale is the mark is given by the mark on the main on, on the vernier scale actually that makes a beautiful straight line when it meets with another mark on the main scale. So if you look at it carefully it is a six marking and therefore the vernier scale reading is 0 0.06 centimeters. Summing them we get 1.66 centimeters. On the next one how about the mean scale reading here? Okay, the zero on the vernier scale is at this particular position, right? So the mean scale reading is read as 3.00 centimeters. How about the vernier scale? Okay, so which of this marking makes vernier caliper? Four things that you need to know about the vernier caliper. First is the what is uh, its sensitivity? Okay, sensitivity. Yeah. Now, just now for ruler, uh, ruler the sensitivity is zero point one cm, right? Meter rule. Uh. The meter rule zero point one cm. Uh, okay, vernier caliper is more sensitive than meter rule. Okay, more sensitive. Uh, okay. Um, so it can measure up to 0 0.01 cm. This one, Mr. Rule, just 0 0.1 cm only. Yeah? But uh, when it caliper, 0 0.01 cm. Make sure that you remember this. Huh? Make sure. Always ask in test or exam. Huh? Okay. Uh, that's the first thing that you need to know. Huh? The sensitivity of when it caliper. Uh, second, you need to know the name of the part and their functions. For example, what is this? What is this? Okay. And what is this? Uh, what is this? Okay. So... Uh, after that, you need to know uh, the sensitivity. Uh, sorry, the scale of the vernier scale. This is the this is the vernier scale. Okay, um, you need to know the sensitivity of this scale. Uh, we we will discuss that later. Okay, and uh, after that is how to take reading from vernier caliper. Okay, even though this is easy, but uh, still a lot of students, eh, uh, quite quite amount of students, they can't read vernier caliper. Okay. So, so make sure that you know all of this uh, because uh, this is very important. Eh? Always come up in exam. Okay. So let's start with the labels. Eh? Okay, we already know the, we already know the sensitivity. Eh? So let's start with the label. Uh, so this is called the main scale. Okay, this is called the main scale. Sometimes they may ask you what is the maximum uh, maximum value can be measured. Okay, usually it's fifteen cm. Eh? Usually. Is 15 cm so we, we can measure up to 15 cm from the main scale and then um, we can see there's a small scale here okay that is called the vernier scale the vernier scale eh? okay so we have a main scale and vernier scale uh, these two you don't need to know the functions eh? you need to know the function just need to know the name eh? main scale vernier scale okay now this is called the inside jaw yeah, inside jaw and you need to know the functions okay the functions of the inside jaw uh, the function is to measure the internal diameter of a, usually it's a cylinder okay internal diameter of a cylinder 
okay and the outside jaw this is the outside jaw and uh, the function is to measure the external diameter of a cylinder okay so inside jaw outside jaw okay and uh, the last one is this one okay and uh, this is called the death prop or sometimes we call it the stem okay and uh, the functions of this uh, this death prop or stem is to to measure the depth of a small hole okay yeah uh, small gaps or small hole uh, okay so we can use this to measure the the depth uh. okay so this is the label of the part and their functions you need to know uh, okay exam they may give you this and then they want you to label and then they ask you the functions uh. okay uh, this will give you a lot of mark if you know the answer okay so make sure that you remember this okay um now this is the vernier scale okay this is the main scale eh? this is from the main scale 0 to 1 cm eh? okay and this is a vernier scale now when you ab observe carefully then you will find that the vernier scale okay the length eh? from 0 to 10 eh? 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 eh? okay from 0 to 10 the length is uh, 0 0.9 cm okay from here to here is 0 0.9 cm i think i should draw it here okay um, it's 0 0.9 cm okay uh, which means which means uh, each unit one unit here each unit is 0 0.09 cm from here to here, 0 0.09. 0 here to here, uh, 0 0.09 cm. Because from here to here is 0 0.9 cm. Uh, and then we divide it by 10. So each unit here is 0 0.09 cm. Uh, okay. Uh, that is what you need to know. Okay. Because exam in exam, they may ask you what's the sensitivity or what's the uh, length. Length of one unit in this vernier scale uh, is 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.09 cm. Uh, okay. So let's write here. Scale. Uh, 0 0.09 cm per unit okay per unit make sure that you remember this eh? this may be asked in your test or exam eh? what's this what's the length of one unit in this vernier scale okay um the last thing is how to take readings right okay so we have this cast the sensitivity the name of the parts and the scale inside this for this vernier scale and now we are going to discuss how to take readings from a uh, this is a micrometer. Uh, sorry, uh, this uh, vernier caliper. Okay. Uh, let's have a cl closer look eh, for this one. Have a closer look at this. Eh. Now, uh, this is the readings of the main scale. Eh? Okay, the reading of the main scale is read from the zero. Okay, zero mark from the main scale eh, to the zero mark of the vernier scale. It's from here to here. Okay. Some, some students, uh, they, they read it from here. They say, oh, this is uh, the readings of the main scale. is uh, about 1.1 cm. That's not correct. Eh? Okay. Uh, the readings of the main scale must take from the mark of this vernier scale. Zero mark at the vernier scale. Okay. So we read from here. So from here to here, this is the readings of the main scale. Okay. And then so here, this is called the readings of the vernier scale. I'll teach you how to read this later. Yeah. Okay. Readings of the vernier scale. And... The readings of the vernier caliper okay is equal to the readings of the main scale this uh, plus the readings of the vernier scale this so this reading plus this reading okay so i'll uh we'll discuss that after this yeah so that's how to take the reading eh? okay for example this one okay this one eh? um so can any of you tell me what's the readings of the main scale two point seven eh? okay how do we know 2.7 okay this is 3 cm right 3 this is 2.9 this is 2.8 eh? this 2.7 2.7 is uh, here okay this is 2.7 eh? 2.7 okay now but this mark shows that is slightly higher than 2.7 right okay 2.7 something eh? maybe 2.78 or 2.79 okay but the main scale the reading is just we say it's just 2.7 eh? this is 2.5 2.6 2.7 2.8 is here and this is slightly lower than 2.7 eh? okay um 
So we say the main scale 2.7, not 2.8. Eh? Some students say, oh, because it's closer to 2.8, nearer to 2.8, so the reading is 2.8. That's not true, okay? The readings of, of the main scale is 2.7. Now, then how about the vernier scale? The vernier scale. Okay, now we take the readings of the vernier scale by seeing which line is coincident with the main scale, okay? Uh, for example, in this case, uh, let me go back, okay? You can see that the scale of this vernier scale, this, the line of, uh, of this vernier scale coincide with this. You see, it, it forms a straight line, right? Coincide means that uh, they, they match and form a straight line, eh? okay? Form a straight line. All the other line, they, are, they does not match, right? Okay, just uh, slightly to the left or slightly to the right. Eh? But this line is coincide with the line in the main scale. Okay, uh, then this is the reading. This is a reading. Eh? The reading is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8, eh? okay. So line where the main scale coincide with the vernier scale, eh? that's where we take the reading. And the reading is uh, 0 0.08 cm. Okay, each, each unit here represent 0 0.1 cm. Eh? Each unit, it represents 0 0.01 cm it represents the length is 0 0.09 cm just now we say the length is 0 0.09 right the vernier scale eh? 0 0.09 eh? but it represents 0 0.01 eh? it represents 0 0.01 cm okay don't take uh, uh, zero, uh this 8 and then times 0 0.9 so that's not correct okay so it's 0 0.08 eh? so uh so the main scale the reading is 2.7 and the vernier scale, the reading is 0 0.08, okay? And we learned that the readings of the vernier caliper is equal to the main scale plus the vernier scale. So 2.78. So just now you see, we learned that here is 2.7 something, right? 2.7 something. So what's the something? The something is this one, 2.7, and this is higher than 2.7, okay? This distance, this small distance here, uh, is measured by the vernier scale. This small distance is measured by the uh, uh, vernier scale, and then we found that it's 0 0.08. Eh? So it's 2.7 here plus 0 0.08 here. So the reading is 2.78. No questions, then I'm going to give you some practice. Okay, this one. Uh, so can any of you tell me what's the reading of the main scale for this one? You have this in your notes. Eh? You have this in your notes. And for your information, you can download the notes if you subscribe to the recorded lessons, January's recorded lessons, Form 4. 2.2, that's correct. 2.2. Okay. How about the vernier scale? Reading of the vernier scale? Okay. Let's check. Uh, okay, I think this one is coincide. Eh? This one coincide with the main scale, right? And it's a uh, 0 0.08, yes. 0 0.08. Eh? Okay. So the readings of this Werner scale will be 2.28, yes. 2.28. Eh? It's a straight line with another marking at the top on, on the main scale itself. If you look carefully, is it the first line, first mark? Nope. Second. There we go. The third mark on the vernier scale makes a beautiful line with another mark on the main scale. Okay, so the vernier scale is read as 0 0.03 centimeters. And summing up, that will give us the length of 3.03 .03 centimeters. In science, time has a symbol small d. And the SI unit for time is the seconds represented by the symbol small s. Now let's have a, look, have a look at this table. This table lists three time measuring instruments, clocks, stopwatch and the ticker tape timer. For this purpose, I will just um, cover the first two instruments. The third one, the ticker tape timer is no longer being used in science lab nowadays. So I'll just leave this be. Right, so what are clocks? Clocks are those clocks that we have at home which the, the ones that we hang on the wall clock or in the school lab. And this clock is able to give us a degree of accuracy up to just one single second itself. 
And as for the stopwatch itself, take note that the stopwatch here refers to digital stopwatch. It is able to give us a degree of accuracy up to 0.01 seconds. Okay. In other words, it can give us reading, for example, like let's say 9.23 seconds. Okay. That is a kind of reading we can take from a digital stopwatch. Now, on this slide, let's have a look at how we can read both these stopwatches. As you can see, both these stopwatch shows quite different kind of uh, design. And uh, very important, just have a look at the display. The display can even show quite, uh, quite a big difference between the first diagram and the second diagram. Okay, before we start reading, let's, uh, let's recall a few important facts. Okay, the first being the accuracy of an electronic or digital stopwatch is 0 0.01 seconds. This simply means that we can measure accurate to two decimal places of a second. Okay, so let's have a look at the diagram on the top. Now, I'd like you to compare the diagram at the top and the bottom. What matters are basically the four digits that's on the right hand side of the stopwatch. Okay, I'm referring to these four digits. And note that out of these four digits itself, the two digits on the right most, like this, they are a little bit smaller than the two digits on the left side. Okay, these are larger, isn't it? Right, so how do we handle this? How do we make sense of this? Well, this is simply the seconds. Okay, so we read this as 38 point. 5, 6 seconds. Well, how about the 12 here, you may ask. Okay, the 12 here, on the left hand side, this refers to the minute. So, in total, basically, this particular stopwatch is telling us or showing us a time of 12 minutes, 38.56 seconds. Now, how about the one at the bottom? Well, the one at the bottom, as you can see, this tells us that this is 13.58 seconds. How about a minute? Well, since it's all shown as zero, we just simply say uh, or uh, record this down as 13.58 seconds. Meter and word meter. Uh, there are two types of stopwatches. Uh, two types of stopwatches. Uh, this is called the analog stopwatch. Okay, analog stopwatch. The sensitivity is 0 0.2 seconds. Uh. You need to know the sensitivity. Okay. Uh, I will discuss the sensitivity with you later. Now this is this this is another stopwatch, okay? Another stopwatch. Uh, it's also analog, uh, but the sensitivity is zero point one. Now how do we know which one is zero point one, which one is zero point two? Okay. Now this one, uh, one round sixty seconds, okay? One round sixty seconds. Uh, so the sensitivity is zero point two. Uh, there is another types of analog stopwatch. Uh, one round only thirty seconds. Thirty, yeah. Uh, one round thirty, and then after they continue 31, 32, 33, 34, uh, Okay. Uh, for this uh, analog stopwatch, uh, the sensitivity is 0 0.1. Okay, so both of these are analog stopwatch. Eh? Okay, uh, this is digital stopwatch. Okay, it's a digital stopwatch, and the sensitivity is 0 0.01. Okay, one second, 0 0.1 second, 0 0.01 seconds. Eh? Sensitivity 0 0.01. So there are two types. Of stopwatches analog and digital and for analog also two types uh, one with 0 0.2 seconds sensitivity another one is uh, with 0 0.1 seconds sensitivity okay the sensitivity uh, again okay now for this stopwatch uh, one round 60 seconds right one round 60 seconds uh, okay if we have a close closer look at this part uh, closer look at this part okay so then we'll see something like this uh, this is zero one two three four five seconds okay zero one two three four five seconds and then we can see that from zero to one seconds uh, there are five divisions right five unit here so one seconds divided by five unit uh, so therefore the sensitivity is 0 0.2 seconds okay uh, the, the second type this one uh, okay uh, so this is zero seconds one seconds two seconds now from zero to one zero to one uh, there are 10 divisions right from zero to one 10 divisions uh. so therefore each one is 0 0.1 seconds so the sensitivity is 0 0.1 seconds uh, this is the stopwatch with uh, 30 second one round uh. this this one 60 second one round this one 30 second one round okay so 
Uh, so you must be careful about the sensitivity of stopwatch, eh? especially the digital stop. Uh, sorry, the, especially the analog stopwatch, because it has two different. It have two types eh? with different scale. Uh, important note: the accuracy of time measurement can be increased by repeated measurements and taking the average value. Okay, because uh, sometimes it may due to a uh, random error, eh? and to reduce random error, we can find we take uh, a few reading and then find the the average. Eh? Okay. And the accuracy depends on the user's reaction time. Okay, uh, for example, that if you want to measure the times, um, when you see, uh, let's say it's in a uh, athletics games, uh, okay, and uh, this person run, you want to f measure how much time he run, uh, okay, so so you are standing here. Okay, you're standing here holding a stopwatch and then you measure the times. Now, when you see him running, okay, when you see him running one, two, three, run, okay, you take, let's say, 0 0.1 uh, second to response. Okay, 0 0.1 seconds eh? means that you see him run, okay, after 0 0.1 second, then only you start pressing on this uh, this uh, stopwatch okay so we say your reaction time eh? your reaction time is 0 0.1 seconds you see after 0 0.1 second then only you press this is the uh, rest uh, reaction time okay mm -hmm. so this is an error right okay suppose you should uh, you should start earlier but because you react slower okay so then this cause error and uh, when he stop here also Maybe, let's say you take another 0 0.1 seconds to respond okay uh, then it will make the reaction times uh, become 0 0.2 seconds and 0 0.1 second at the beginnings and 0 0.1 second at the back at the end of the uh, the, the this uh, running okay so you see so the accuracy depends on the re the reaction time eh? if, if you can react very fast then the error is very low if you react uh, slowly and then the reaction time will be very high okay uh, this may be asked in objective questions, eh? so you must know. The accuracy depends uh, can be reduced by taking average, and uh, the, the accuracy depends on the user's reaction time. Okay, taking reading. Eh? Taking reading. Now, how to take reading? Eh? Uh, you must know that for any... This, this is uh, the analog stopwatch. Eh? There are two scale. Okay. One in the middle here is called a minute scale. Each one, uh, each one is one minute, okay. And then we have a big circle here. This is called the second scale, okay. This is for you to measure seconds, uh, second, five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds, right? Okay, so we have a minute scale and second scale. So the the reading is equal to the minute scale, okay. Minutes, uh, one, two, three, four, four minutes, right? Four minutes, and then the second scale. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14.2, uh, 14.2, okay, but then, just now we have learned that each one, uh, each one small unit here, it represents 0 0.2 second, right, okay, so 14, 14.2, 14 14.4, uh, so even though this is two unit, but each one is 0 0.2 second, uh, 14, 14.2, 14.4, so the second scale show 14.4 seconds, uh, Okay, so the total time is 4 minutes, 14.4 seconds. Okay, so the reading is 4, four minutes, 14.4 seconds. A lot of students, they, uh, they do not see this. Because when this come out in the exam, okay, they show you this diagram and then they want you to give reading. And the stu students straight away take, oh, okay, 14, 14 point, uh, some students they give 14.2, okay. And uh, some students they give 14.4, that's all. Okay, they do not read the minute scale, eh? Okay, so you must give your reading in the minute scale. The minute scale plus the uh, second scale. That is uh, how, how we take reading. Eh? Sometimes they will give you this stopwatch. Okay, uh, again, we have two scale. Okay, the minute scale and the second scale. Okay, but this one, one round, one round 30 seconds. Eh? One round 30 seconds. Okay, so the minute scale, uh, this is two. Two minutes, uh, this is one minute. Start from here, zero, 0 0.5. Uh, 
0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, okay, 1.5. This is slightly higher than 1.5, okay. So the minute scale shows 1.5 minutes, not 1, eh? because students, oh, this is 0, this is 1. So this is 1, 1, point, uh, one minute. That's not correct, okay. We have 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5. Eh? So the uh, minute scale shows 1.5. Eh? Uh, the second scale, it shows, um, this is 17, right? Okay, 17, 17.1, 17 17.2, uh, okay? For uh, for digital stopwatch, at uh, one round, 30 seconds. Each small unit here is uh, 0 0.1 seconds. So 17, 17.1, 17.2 seconds. Uh. So the second scale is 17.2, so therefore the correct readings will be one minute, uh, 47.2 seconds, okay, 47.2 seconds, okay, uh, so that is how we take the reading eh, from this stopwatch. Okay, any questions so far for taking re uh, taking reading from uh, analog stopwatch, two types of analog stopwatch, eh? okay, no question, then uh, let's proceed to temperature, okay, so we use uh, liquid, liquid in glass thermometer, eh? mercury thermometer to measure uh, temperature okay and there are a the few things that you need to know about the thermometer you need to know that in lab in our lab uh, laboratories we use two types of thermometer the first one is a range from negative 10 to 110 degree okay uh, usually they will ask you what's the sensitivity you need to know the sensitivity okay uh, they will only ask you about the sensitivity yeah? another one is the from 0 to 360 degrees celsius eh? Uh, also, you need to know the sensitivity. So for the first one, the sensitivity is 1 degree Celsius. And for the second one, the sensitivity will be uh, 2 degrees Celsius. That's what you need to remember. So in, in lab, normally we use these two uh, thermometer. The one from negative 10 to 110, and another one is 0 to 360. The first one, sensitivity 1 degree Celsius. The second one, the sensitivity 2 degree Celsius. Uh, sometimes they may ask you, why we use mercury why don't we use other liquids uh, so there that's why you need to know the advantages of mercury this will come out in essay questions eh? advantages of using mercury in a, a thermometer uh, the first one is because it's a good heat conductor it can conduct the heat to the whole mercury faster and easier yeah so it's a good conductor second it does not wet the wall of the tube it, it do not cling on the wall of the tube, eh? okay. Uh, for example, sir, let's say this is a thermometer, okay, and this is a wall. Uh, this is a tube, eh? okay, and uh, this is a mercury. Let's say this is a mercury. So the mercury does not stick here. There's no mercury stick here, okay. Yeah, it does not stick on the wall. If it stick on the wall, then it will make the volume here lower than what it should be. Yeah? Uh, then stick, this will reduce the accuracy or the sense, uh, uh, this will re reduce the accuracy. But this does not happen to mercury. Yeah? So mercury does not wet the wall. So that's why, that, that, uh, therefore it's more accurate. Okay. Um, it can be seen easily. Uh, silvery gray. Yeah? The color is silvery gray. It's not transparent. Uh, compared to alcohol, alcohol is transparent. So this can be read easily. Okay. Uh, so that is the three advantages of using mercury. Yeah. Make sure that you remember this. Uh, good heat conductor does not wet the wall and it can be seen easily. Then sensitivity. Uh, sometimes they may ask you how to increase the sensitivity of uh, this uh, thermometer. Okay. So uh, if you use mercury, yeah, it will be more sensitive compared to alcohol because usually we use either uh, mercury or alcohol. Eh? So using mercury is more sensitive because mercury is sensitive to temperature change. Just just small change only, then the, it will expand or contract a lot. Eh? So sensitive to temperature change and it's a good heat conductor as we discussed just now. And then we use a thin wall glass bulb. Okay, now Let's say we have a mercury thermometer. This is a mercury thermometer. Okay. Uh, this is a tube. Eh? And this is called the bulb. Okay. 
This is called a bub. Eh? Okay. Now the bub here, the wall here should be thin. Eh? Okay. The wall here should be thin because we use this to we, we usually insert this to the object to measure the temperature. So if it's thin, then the heat can be transferred easily into the mercury. Okay. If the wall is thin, eh, the the heat can go in easily. But if it's thick, then it takes longer time for the heat to transfer inside. Then it, it becomes less sensitive. Eh? So if you want to make the thermometer sensitive, then the wall of the bulb here must be small, or must be thin. Okay. Uh, so the heat can transfer faster from the heat source into the mercury if the wall is thin. And then the, the small diameter capillary tube. Now this is called a capillary tube. Sometimes it's called a bore. Eh? It's called a bore or the tube, the capillary tube, okay? Uh, try to use a small diameter one, okay? This, this is very big, right, the diameter. That diameter is, uh, the diameter is measuring from here to here. Uh, this is called a diameter. Try to use a small diameter because if diameter is small, then uh, uh, the, 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 the change of the level, okay, increase, decrease. Uh, if the diameter is small, then it will increase, decrease a lot when the small change of the volume, okay? Uh, because small expansion and contractions in the mercury can cause a large change uh, in the reading. Okay. Okay. Measuring electricity. Uh, measuring electricity, we will uh, we are going to use ammeter usually ammeter and watt meter uh, to measure. And ammeter ammeter is used to measure electric currents. Uh, electric currents. Okay. And uh, accuracy. The normal emitter, the accuracy is 0 0.1 ampere or 0 0.2 ampere. You don't you don't need to memorize this because usually they will show you the emitter and then you can, and then you can identify the sensitivity from the picture. Okay, so you don't need to sh remember this. Uh, uh, unlike this uh, uh, vernier caliper, micrometer, stopwatch, and a thermometer, you need to memorize the sensitivity. Yeah? But for emitter and wattmeter, you don't need to memorize the sensitivity. They will give you the pictures of the instrument and then they want you to identify the sensitivity from the picture, okay? Uh, but for milliammeter, okay, the accuracy will be 0 0.1 milliampere or 0 0.2 milliampere. This is 0 0.1 ampere, 0 0.2 ampere, okay? Uh, uh, one important thing is the connections of emitter. It must be connected series, uh, in series with the electrical circuits. This emitter, this is the resistor, and this is the uh, bulb. Eh? So it must be connected in series. Okay, emitter must be connected in series. Eh? Okay. Uh, for watt meter, it's used to measure voltage or potential difference. Eh? Potential difference and voltage are the same. Okay. Uh, accuracy usually is 0 0.1 watt or 0 0.2 watt. Okay. And it must be connected parallel. This is the bulb, and then the watt meter must be connected parallel to the uh, uh, this uh, electrical instruments, okay, or the resistor, okay, it must be connected parallel. That's what you need to know. So when we compare this emitter, uh, emitter is to measure currents, voltmeter, measure voltage. Uh, the circuit symbol, okay, is A, uh, a, a, a circle with A, okay. And for uh, voltmeter. Okay, mm, sorry. Uh, the emitter must be connected series, uh, in series. Okay, this is the emitter, this is, a, uh, this is the resistor. It must be connected in series. But for wood meter, it must be connected parallel. Uh, parallel. And then it's a circle, the, the symbol is a circle with a V. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is what you need to know about emitter and wood meter. Let's go back to the my map.